Today I'm going to um, talk about spring ephemerals and other early season bloomers for pollinators. And this time I've added a little more information from my last presentation. Oops. Why is it not going down? There we go. I, I learned a wonderful expression about the blooming uh, the, the spring blooming trees, they're like a meadow in the sky. And uh, if you look at those trees and imagine, wouldn't that be a, a meadow completely full of flowers? I think it's a beautiful way of expressing um, the need for our native blooming trees and might get people more excited about planting them. This, uh, this is Circus canadensis, the um, native American red bud. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's one of the earliest bloomers and it's beautiful. The name Circus canadensis, well, Canada means that's what was first discovered, but the Circus um, is a, like the shuttle and it refers to the shape of the seed pods, which I thought was kind of, or a spindle, I'm sorry, the shape of the, um, the seed pods. Another very early bloomer are the pussy willows and many of us have enjoyed cutting them did you know that pussy willows are dioecious, which means that they have separate male and female plants? And the salix means that is, is Latin for the willow. And the discolor is very interesting. The uh, male and female flowers are different colors, and that's why it has the, uh, that specific epithet. And the pussy willows are amazing. They support at least 13 different specialist bees. Have you ever gotten up close to a blooming red maple? If you haven't, I encourage you to do so. And also take your hand lens, start carrying your hand lens around when you're looking at flowers. Um, the red maple, Acer rubrum, is, this is a, you know, a $64,000 question. What does polygamo dioecious mean? Well, <laughs> it means that some trees are polygamous and some are dioecious. Dioecious means that they have the male and female flowers are on separate trees. However, occasionally there will be a maple tree with a branch that has uh, flowers of the opposite sex on it. And so that's why they have the name polygamo dioecious. They bloom very early, March to April. And on cool days, at at least 50 degrees, the little bumblebees with their fur coats will be coming out to pollinate them. And on warmer um, early spring days, the honeybees will be there. The uh, picture on the top left is the uh, male. You can see the anthers. And the bottom right, you see the, the stigmas. Amazing. Didn't know that. Right. Then we have the oligolectic. We talked about this last time. Maybe some of you remember that term. 25% um, of all our native bees, at least 25%, are pollen specialists. And that means that their larvae require specific pollen in order to develop properly. And oligo meaning few and lectic means gather. So they can only gather from a very limited number of plants and many of them from just one single species. Some of the other bees are weak oligolectics and they have preferred plants but they, if those plants are not available, they can substitute pollen from other plants. Here's a, a picture from my backyard. This in the spring when the ragwort, the Pacra aurea is blooming and it has its own specialist bee, the Andrina gardineria. So it's interesting, um, the difference between oligolectic and polylectic bees. It seems that the, um, Oligolectic were the original, the ancestral bees. And these were the ones that can only use pollen from a specific plant. The polylectic bees evolved later. And these are the ones who can gather pollen from any available plant source that's suitable. And so this is how they changed. And it's interesting that not only do we, not only do we have oligolectic bees in the spring, there are also some for the fall plants. The, um, this is gonna talk about the ephemeral adrena bees. These are the digging digger bees or the minor bees. Now these are solitary ground nesting bees that emerge very early in the spring. 
And they're called ephemeral because they're only around for just a few weeks at most. When the female bee comes out, she's gonna be busy foraging on flowers to get pollen and nectar during the day. And what she will do is she will combine the pollen and the nectar and make a little ball of what's called bee bread. And she'll lay her egg on top of that bee bread. And that will be, and seal that off and that will be one offspring. And then she'll go back out and gather more nectar and pollen and continue laying eggs. And the um, spring uh, oligolectic bees, the adults remain underground until the following spring. The oligolectic bees in the fall um, tend to overwinter as, as larvae in the soil. And the bottom right shows that it's very important if to leave some bare ground for bees like the minor mining bees, they need this. And sand is very bad, is a bad place for them because it keeps collapsing on them. I don't know why, there. Then here's another one, the um, Andrina Bradleyi, which can only feed on members of the vaccinium family or the blueberries. Isn't that an amazing photo? Then there's an oligolectic bee that only feeds on the sweet azalea, the Cornell azalea bee. Then this is one of my favorite times of the year is when the, um, the deciduous uh, forests start blooming. And this is when the early spring ephemeral, ephemerals will come out. The picture on the left shows a woodland full of trilliums. And this is very much like the woodlands in my grandfather's farm in Michigan. And I remember um, spending many, many hours in these woods. And I think that's when my love of native plants first began. And it's very easy to grow the, many of these plants in your home gardens. So if you can't get to the woods, you can have the joy of growing these same plants at home. And these are the trillium. The name trillium, um, tri for three, they have three leaves, three sepals and three petals. And they're pollinated by many different um, bees. Then we're talking about the ephemeral flowers and ephemeral means eph evanescent or fleeting. And these plants will be found on the forest floor before the leaves come out. And they have to work very quickly. As soon as the ground thaws, they start to emerge, they form their leaves, their flowers and form seeds. And then as the um, canopy closes, they disappear and they will remain dormant underground in many different ways, sometimes as perennial roots and rhizomes like the may apple here, sometimes as bulbs or corms or tubers. The may apple is kind of neat because um, the, the fruit there on the um, bottom left is um, really enjoyed by our box turtles. And the seeds of the may apple will germinate only after they pass through the gut of a box turtle or other animal. It's the acid in the uh, stomach of the animals that allows the, bird, the uh, seeds to uh, germinate. And if we have fewer box turtles, I think maybe part of the reason is we have fewer may apples and vice versa. This is another beautiful um, early spring plant, the spring beauty, the Claytonia virginica. Um, do you see the pink lines? Those are nectar guides for the bees and they have their own mining bee. And these pictures were taken by Mike Rupp. These um, plants overwinter as little corms or nutlets underground. And they were very, uh, they're very nutritious and favored by um, bears in the early spring, this early source of food. Native Americans uh, use them as food. I think they're a glorious little plant. I have some and mine have um, seeded themselves around for which I'm very grateful. Then there's a specific mining bee for violets. Trout lily has, has a, a large mining bee that can only feed on it. It's called trout lily. If you look at the leaves, do you see the modeling? It's, um, it resembles the modeling on the, on the uh, scales of a, of a trout. Being Dutch, I've always loved Dutchman's breeches. 
and these were in my grandfather's woods. They're beautiful. Um, they're pollinated by honeybees, mason bees, bumblebees, and andrenid bees. And you're going to need a long tongue because the nectar is going to be at the tips of the, like where the bottom of the trousers would be. Dutchman's breeches. Then we have bellworts. The one on the um, right is the um, bellwort, the uvularia perfoliata. If you look closely, you can see how the stem goes right through the leaf and that's how you get the perfoliata. And the um, uvula is that little dingle tangle at the back of your throat and the flower was named after that. And um, they have their own specific um, oligolectic mining bee, Andrina uvularii, but they also can be uh, pollinated by bumblebees and mason bees. Then there's the beautiful wild geranium, geranium maculatum. And it has, again, a specific oligolectic pollinator. Jacob's ladder, polymonium reptans, again, has its own specific pollinator. And if these plants are not there, those bees will disappear. And I was reading that these little mining bees, because they're pretty small, they're, um, they can only travel 400 yards maximum. So if they don't have the food within 400 yards of their little nest in the ground, they're out of luck and they're going to disappear from the landscape. Then we have the Dodecatheon media, the shooting star. I have a nice big clump of this and I enjoy it very much. And it has a, the, the queen bumblebee pollinates it using sonication or buzz pollination. Zizia aurea or golden Alexandria. I'm sorry, golden Alexander's on um, blooms in April to June. And again, Andrina zizii is its oligolectic pollinator. Um, it's also the host plant for the uh, black swallowtail because it's in the APAC or carrot family. Then we have the um, Coletus estivalis. Um, this Coletus means it, it glues things together. So, and so it, it makes a, like a cellophane like covering around its um, larvae to protect it from the um, environment. And estivalis means summer. And it's uh, oligolectic on the hookera, the hookera um, americana. I often see this growing in the rocks uh, along the CNO Canal or up in the mountains. Again, blooming fairly early, April to June. Then there's water leaf, hydrophyllum. Again, a specific oligolectic bee. Then we have the um, mason bee, Osmia distincta. And, and this little bee is going to pollinate the eastern or smooth um, beard tum, the penstemon lavagatus, which is going to begin blooming in May. I grow this and I get a lot of bee activity. So what can we as gardeners do to help these very early bees? Because obviously there's not a lot blooming unless we have the specific things they need. So please plant the native, the native spring ephemerals for them and the early blooming trees, those meadows in the skies, as well as the um, blooming shrubs and, and other forbs. Another thing you can do is I'm starting to get catalogs now for ordering bulbs for um, fall planting. And people go, well, these bulbs I know are not native, but in the early spring, they can provide a lot of pollen and nectar for our bees. So yes, we can safely include some non-natives in our garden. We don't have to be 100% native plants in our gardens. And I was reading um, some research that Doug Tallamy and his graduate students had done and they said our goal should be to have at least 70% native plants in our landscapes. So some favorite non-natives can be enjoyed. 
as long as they are not invasive. So that means no Nandina, heavenly bamboo, bad name, no bud layer, butterfly bush, no pachysandra or English ivy, no barberries, no rose of Sharon. I didn't know it was invasive till I saw huge patches of it in the abandoned farm behind us and no miscanthus, etc. So the bees and beekeepers say plants bring bulbs and I got permission from uh, one of the owners of Van England uh, Bulb Company to use these wonderful pictures that she took personally. Um, you can have spring bulbs from early spring till late in the spring and they're most of them are very rich in nectar and pollen. Some of the earliest would be the winter aconite. And then we would have the snowdrops. And I think Shannon was talking about her snowdrops. Then we have the um, large flowering Dutch crocus. What fun to see these in the spring. Then we have the later blooming, the species tulips, hyacinths, anemone, camacia, Kyanodoxa, glory of the snow, the Corylus, the Fritillaria, etc. More beautiful pictures. Uh oh, what am I doing here? Well, remember I said we could have at least 70, we need 70%, which gives us 30% chance to um, experiment and, and feed our, our souls as well as feed the bees. I had never thought of dahlias as being a good source of um, pollen and nectar for the bees until I read the recent Two Million Blossoms magazine. And um, Rusty Berlow talked about how she loves to grow dahlias because they tend to bloom mid-July to frost. And there's sometimes it's a slow period in our gardens and she recommends the ones that have the open um, disc, which is full of pollen, and she called it a cistern of nectar. So you want the uh, single petals, like the one on the top right. Then we have the collaret, the top left, the peony type on the bottom right, and then the orchid with the twisted leaves. I'd never seen an orchid one before. But they're beautiful. She says they're very easy to grow, even from seed. If you grow from seed in the spring, you can get a blooming plant by the end of summer. And you can grow them from cuttings and from you can buy the root tubers many places. And of course, people often overwinter them. So just a little bit of fun in your garden and know that you're also doing good things for the bees. Then um, I was listening to many um, presentations over the weekend and including, uh, excuse me, Um, Kim Ironman, and she was talking about pollinator stewardship and how we can be good stewards of the land and of our bees. And she suggested that we need to have three different native species blooming at any one time in their gardens from early spring through frost. And she suggested that we have a minimum of three square feet per species growing in our gardens. And the best of all, I think, is keeping a record of our blooming plants. This way we'll find out if, oh, we don't have anything growing in mid-June or late August. What's missing? Because many times we're waiting for the asters to open or for the goldenrods to start blooming. So if you keep this record and you look at it, you can see, I need some plants in late summer. So then you can add them. And the other thing she mentions is that we can, if we have smaller property properties, we can work with our neighbors and creating pollinator corridors or pathways. And there's a great organization up in New England where they have done just this. And they're even getting um, pathways going through towns and connecting towns. And I've given you the website and it'll be when you look at the um, presentation later. You can look them up again, but it's the pollinatorpathway.org. It's a tremendous site. It has a lot of great information and I highly recommend that you look it up. Other um, resources that I used, and I, I hope we can have them in the library at the office, would be um, Kim Ironman's The Pollinator Victory Garden, 
Paige Embry's Our Native Bees. And of course, Heather Holm has two great books, Bees and ID and Native Plant Forage Guide, Pollinator of Native Plants. Timothy Walker has a Brit British guy, but he's written a very interesting book on pollination. The Xerxes Society has the Attracting Native Pollinators and 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. And then again, I really encourage you to, to um, subscribe to Two Million Blossoms. It's not very expensive. I read it every month from cover to cover and I've really, and really learned a lot. So um, I'd like to see if you have any questions.